What structure is identified by the pink arrow? On this sagittal CT, we see a linear hyperdense structure between the peritoneal fat and an umbilical wall defect. Axial CT shows a similar appearance. There are no bowel loops that protrude through this defect. This patient is post-surgical. This was an umbilical hernia repair mesh. Preoperatively, the patient had a 3 cm hernia, causing increasing daily pain. Note the absence of the mesh repair on the preoperative image. Intraoperatively, a hernia was identified. Fat contents were then reduced. The defect was measured at about 3 by 3 cm. The team then proceeded with placing a 10 by 15 cm pariatex mesh. This allowed a large coverage of the defect. The mesh was secured with four proline transfascial sutures at the four cardinal points. A double crown was then made with secure straps. This was done under reduced pneumoperitoneal pressure without tension. At the end of the procedure, the mesh adequately covered the defect. Here's a separate case in an elderly female with previous laparoscopic repair of ventral and incisional hernia with a dual mesh gore. She presented with pain and swelling at the left side of repair. There was a clinical suspicion for recurrence, but CT showed adequate and sufficient repair with a mesh showing the thin arrows, shown by the thin arrows. There was a diagnosis though of a trocar site hernia shown by the thick arrow. Here are several examples of surgical meshes. The top left shows a progrip mesh before intraperitoneal placement. The top right image shows the progrip mesh after intraperitoneal placement under laparotomy. And the bottom left image shows a ventralex mesh. The circular patch is available in different sizes. This table shows the commercial names of the different types of flat sheet mesh. There's a lot to remember. And this table shows the commercial names of the different types of composite surgical meshes. PTFE stands for polytetrafluoroethylene. Most meshes are not absorbable. They are made of either expanded PTFE, PP, or polypropylene, or PE, polyester. Expanded PTFE is a microporous synthetic material used intraperitoneally due to a low risk of host inflammation reaction, but incorporation into the abdominal wall is limited. PP and PE are macroporous meshes that allow a good integration in the abdominal wall by colonization of the prosthesis by host collagen fibers, but with an important inflammation reaction. These components are used alone or in combination. A flat sheet mesh is made of a single material. In contrast, a composite or biface mesh is made of two different materials, one on the parietal side, such as PPE or PTFE or PE, and one on the visceral side, usually PTFE or an absorbable material. Biface meshes have a good tissue ingrowth into the abdominal wall and a low risk of bowel complications, but they are more expensive. Some who have operated a long time ago may still have old generation prosthetic mesh made of only PTFE. They can be located in premuscular or intraperitoneal space. They're not really used anymore because of their poor incorporation inside the abdominal wall and not as commercially available. They are well visible in CT due to their high attenuation value. Fixation of the mesh is accomplished via staples, tacks, or sutures with absorber materials or glue, but self-fixating meshes are available such as the Progrip Covidian. On CT, only staples and tacks are visible. Here is the abdominal wall anatomy. The above drawing shows relevant abdominal wall relationships with the surgical mesh. EOM stands for external oblique muscle, IOM stands for internal oblique muscle, AARM stands for anterior aponeurosis of the rectus muscle, PARM is the posterior aponeurosis, RM is rectus muscle, TM is transverse muscle, FT is fascia transversalis, and P is peritoneum. The asterisks highlight the premuscular space, or onlay between the skin and AARM. This is in contrast to the retromuscular space, or sublay, between the rectus muscle and PPRM. The intraperitoneal space, or underlay, is between the greater omentum and peritoneum. Corresponding CT is shown below. This axial CT shows normal postoperative findings after surgical mesh placement. Here we see a thin, hyperattenuating, and continuous line corresponding to a surgical mesh located above the rectus abdominis muscle in the premuscular space. This next image shows a hyperattenuating line corresponding to an intraperitoneal flat sheet mesh in polytetrafluoroethylene. The next image shows a thin and regular line corresponding to an intraperitoneal mesh 
Pritex with tax, indicated by the short arrows. Here, we see a thin, continuous hypertenuing line located behind the rectus muscle, corresponding to a retromuscular mesh. This was progrip. Note that it is nearly impossible to differentiate between intraperitoneal and retromuscular locations by CT alone. Now, let's see some complication. This is a postoperative abscess in a lady with septic shock and abdominal pain many months after surgical mesh placement. This image shows a fluid collection in the anterior abdominal wall with a mesh floating inside, indicated by the arrow. Intraoperative images shows the mesh in the abscess. This next example is a postoperative hematoma. This patient presented with abdominal pain three days after incisional hernia repair with a retromuscular mesh, i.e. progrip. This image shows a hyperattenuating collection in the abdominal wall. There is no enhancement of the collection. The mesh was not visible. This next case is one of a postoperative seroma. This patient had abdominal pain and serious weeping of the scar a few weeks after post-traumatic ventral hernia repair using an intraperitoneal mesh. Here we see a homogeneous preperitoneal fluid collection indicated by the asterisk. The collection showed no enhancement. The thin hypertenuating line behind the collection represented the mesh. Sagittally, we again see the preperitoneal location. This next case is one of a small bowel fistula. This patient had digestive fluid leaking from her drains a few days after wall repair with an intraperitoneal mesh, Pritex. The arrows show subcutaneous fat straining. There is a defect of a small bowel loop shown by the smaller short arrow. This small bowel loop defect connected with an abdominal wall. Sagittal CT confirmed the defect of the small bowel loop and subcutaneous gas indicating a fistula. This next case is of a cutaneous fistula. This patient had purulent discharge from the umbilical port a few months after surgical hernia repair using a retromuscular mesh, mersaline. Here we see an anterior wall fluid collection with peripheral enhancement. Note the fatty transformation of the rectus muscle indicated by the asterisk. Although the mesh was not visible, we could see the radiopaque tack seen by the short arrow. After administration of water-soluble contrast through the cutaneous hole, we see a communication with the mesh. The small bowel loops behind the mesh were fortunately normal. Next case is a small bowel obstruction. This patient had cramping and vomiting a few days after umbilical hernia repair with an intraperitoneal mesh, Ventralex. We see dilated small bowel loops with the transition zone close to the operative site, seen by the long arrow. There is also fluid collection between the bowel loops and abdominal wall, seen on the right-hand image. The mesh was not radiographically visible. Here's another small bowel obstruction. In ca this case, there was migration of the mesh. This patient had a prior history of colectomy and presented with abdominal pain and vomiting. Again, we see dilated small bowel loops, but this time there is an intraluminal foreign body indicated by the long arrow in the bottom left and top right images. This foreign body was hyperattenuating and contained a tack seen by the short arrow. Gross pathology confirmed a parietal mesh that migrated into the small bowel, seen on the bottom right. Here's a case of small bowel perforation. This patient developed sudden pain a few days after abdominal wall repair using an intraperitoneal mesh, Ventralex. We see free air around the liver and close to the abdominal wall. Small bowel loops shown by the arrows are located adjacent to the abdominal wall. During surgery, two tiny holes were found in bowel loops. This case is one of a granuloma. This patient had a prior history of colectomy and ileostomy and presented with abdominal pain after incisional hernia repair using intraperitoneal mesh, Ventralex. The asterisk highlights a solid nodule above the intraperitoneal mesh, indicated by the arrows. This was possibly consistent with peritoneal carcinomatosis, but there are no other nodules visible on CT. After mesh resection, pathology revealed only fibrous nodule without malignancy. Here's an example of mesh retraction in different patients. The top two images show a recurrent hernia many years after incisional hernia repair using an intraperitoneal mesh, Pariotex.
The short arrow notes hyperattenuating subcutaneous fat close to the mesh, indicated by the long arrow. The mesh happened to be thickened and broken. The bottom left image shows a different patient. Here, there was prior incisional hernia repair using an intraperitoneal mesh. CT showed a folded mesh indicated by the arrow. There's also a focal thickening of the abdominal wall. The last case in the bottom right is one of prior abdominal wall repair again. We see a folded and thickened mesh. This last case shows a recurrent hernia many years after abdominal wall repair using an intraperitoneal mesh, Pritex. We see a hypogastric hernia containing epipoic fat shown by the thin arrows. The mesh was intact and it was indicated by the large arrows. The new parietal weakness was favored to be related to obesity. You now know a ton about hernia mesh repairs. Please subscribe for more awesome anatomy and radiology videos.